My name is Andrew Pettiprin. I am fellow of popular culture at the Word on Fire Institute. Incredible privilege that I get to be here uh, with you, and a special privilege that I get to be here with my friends Holly Ordway and Father Michael Ward. All three of us, by the way, are um, what is in, in just sort of popular parlance called converts from Anglicanism. Um, so any other former Anglicans in the room? There might even be some current Anglicans in the room if you are. God bless you. <laughs> Welcome. We're going to talk about an Anglican today. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to just tell you a little more about Holly and Father Michael so that uh, if you're not familiar with their work, you can um, sit there while listening to them on your phones and order their books. It's <laughs> <laughs> one of the best things you could do with your time. Um, Father Michael Ward is a Catholic priest of the personal ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham. Uh, and like me, actually a former Anglican cleric before he was a Catholic priest. Um, he's also a member of the Faculty of Theology and Religion at the University of Oxford and Professor of Apologetics at Houston Christian University in Texas. He is author of um, the great book Planet Narnia, which I hope all of you have, have read or at least intend to read and, and have it on your shelf. It's a wonderful book. He's also the author of After Humanity, which is a book about C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, which was published by us at Word on Fire. And I'm pleased to say that Father Michael and I, along with David Baird, a third contributor, have a book coming out this year called Popcorn with the Pope, which is a guide to the films on the Vatican film list. So um, did any of you know there was such a thing as the Vatican film list? Well, you're going to want to buy our book. I'm <laughs> down for sure. So welcome to Father Michael. Holly is my colleague at Word on Fire. She's the Fellow of Faith and Culture at the Word on Fire Institute, and she holds a PhD in English from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She is the author of Tolkien's Modern Reading, Middle Earth Beyond the Middle Ages, which is an absolutely fantastic book that you must all read. Um, she's also the author of Tales of Faith and is the author of the forthcoming spiritual biography of J.R.R. Tolkien, which is called Tolkien's Faith, a spiritual biography due out later this year, also from Word on Fire. I'm told that you can pre-order that book in the United States on Amazon, but not here in the UK yet. So please be on the lookout for that when it, when it comes out. But um, I'm just delighted to be able to share the stage today with Holly and with Michael. So let's, let's launch right in. If all of you are here today, I'm, I'm assuming that you have some familiarity with the two, uh, the two authors that we're going to discuss today, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, who are two giants of 20th century literature in the English language, to be sure. And I can certainly speak from my own experience as somebody whose uh, faith uh, was transformed and deepened by reading both of them at different times in my life. And that's um, one of the many things that we want to get at here today. So before we go any further, although I'm sure you all know who each of these men uh, are and what they've written, at least in part, let's just um, have each, uh, each of our speakers just sketch briefly who each man was and, uh, and what his faith, faith was like. So I think we'll start with Lewis, Michael. Tell us about Lewis and his faith. Yes. So um, when Andrew mentioned that we're going to be discussing an Anglican, the Anglican we're going to be discussing is C.S. Lewis. Um, I'm glad that we are at this Catholic conference um, spending some serious time considering uh, such a figure. He was born at the end of the 19th century in Belfast to an Anglican family. His grandfather was an Anglican clergyman in, in Belfast. Um, he was baptized as an infant, brought up in the faith, but then perhaps in part because of his mother's death when he was not quite 10. Um, in his teens, Lewis turned away from his faith and then called himself an atheist for the best part of two decades. Um, although during that period, he was actually confirmed in the Church of England. Um, and he later called that one of the worst uh, things he ever did, being confirmed in utter disbelief. He did it because it was socially expected and his father sort of required it of him, but he was later very ashamed of it. Um, Lewis fought in the First World War, uh, was very nearly killed, um, saw men die, saw the battlefield littered with sitting and standing corpses, as he later recalled. Um, had a brilliant career at Oxford, reading first of all classics and then English. He got first class degrees in, in both subjects, and he then spent about 30 years as a fellow in English at Oxford before moving to the other place, Cambridge. Um, 
where he finished his career as the very first professor of medieval Renaissance English at Cambridge. Um, as regards his faith, he slowly inched his way back to, first of all, a belief in God, a theistic belief uh, in the late 1920s, and then thanks in no small part to Tolkien, as we will no doubt be discussing in a moment, um, finally got his way back to Christian belief in, in his early 30s. Um, and after he had returned to his, his, the Christian faith of his infancy, um, his faith life took off and he, he began to become a, a very prominent Christian apologist. Um, his best known work in that line is probably Mere Christianity, which was based on radio broadcasts he gave during the Second World War. Um, but also, of course, he's, he's very well known for his Christian fiction, most notably the Chronicles of Narnia and works like the Screwtape Letters. Um, his late life was interesting in that he, in his late 50s, he, he finally got round to being married. Um, he married a, a divorced ex-Jewish communist atheist Christian American, um, <laughs> uh, Joy Davidman. And you may have seen the film Shadowlands uh, with Anthony Hopkins and Deborah Winger, um, which is a beautiful, though rather inaccurate, telling of, of that late romance in his life, um, which, which gave rise to one of his most challenging books, uh, a short book called A Grief Observed, in which he talks about seeing his, his wife die and, and the grief that it occasioned. Um, and Lewis himself died just three years after his wife in 1963, on the very same day, the very same hour that President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. That's very helpful, Michael. And, and let's hear maybe the same kind of praise from you, Holly, about, about Tolkien and his life and his sort of development of faith. Right, so, uh, so Tolkien was actually born in Bloemfontein, South Africa um, in 1892, so a little bit older than, uh, than Lewis. And he also was born an Anglican. Um, his his uh, parents were members of the Anglican Church there. Um, and so the first eight years of his life were lived as, as a child in, in the Anglican church. Uh, his father died um, when, he was a, uh, when he was four. His mother brought him back to, uh, him and his little brother Hillary brought him back to England um, as, you know, as a, now as a widow. And then in 1900, she entered the Catholic church. And at the time, this was just a catastrophic social move. Um, she was effectively cut off by her family. Um, they cut off financial help for her. So she was then suddenly impoverished as a widow with two small boys. Um, it was a hard thing to be a Catholic convert at that time, um, but she stuck with it. And this, this impressed Tolkien greatly. He, he remembered all his life, the great um, cost that his mother paid for her faith and the effort she made to hand it on to him. But interestingly, um, because he was eight, uh, when his mother became a Catholic, he was actually past the age of reason, past the age at which he would have been, as it were, grandfathered in to the Catholic Church with his mother. So he was considered as someone who was came into the church in his own right, you know, as an adult, um, at his confirmation and first Holy Communion, which at that time took place at the same time, um, just before his twelfth birthday. So I think it's really interesting to note that Tolkien is also a convert um, from Anglicanism to Catholicism, because in that era, um, he, had, he had the opportunity to return to the faith of his, his dead father um, and to his, his grandparents on both sides, um, but, but chose instead to you know, continue in the church that his mother had adopted. Um, and he would have remembered his Anglican um, youth, because you know, at eight years old, he had a very strong memory and could remember things from even when he was a little child. So his mother then died um, when he was 12, uh, leaving him a complete orphan. And he was raised then by his guardian, Father Francis Morgan of the Birmingham Oratory of St. Philip Neri. Um, and this became a tremendous influence on his life, the, the congregation of, uh, of St. Philip Neri. Um, so he ended up um, falling in love with um, Edith Bratt, um, who was a Protestant, um, and, uh, and getting extremely, extremely distracted from his studies so much so that his guardian said, you cannot see her again until you come of age. Um, and interestingly, Tolkien accepted this. Um, so we have this sort of conventional narrative of the, you know, the hard-hearted Catholic priest squashing young love. 
But in, in fact, it, it, he said it was very hard and painful and bitter, but he came later on to recognize that, that his guardian had been right because he had, in fact, failed his first entrance exam into Oxford uh, and being poor, he, he had to get a scholarship where he, where he wasn't going to go. And his guardian, I think, saw immediately that this was his, his career, his vocation to be a scholar. Um, so he ended up getting into Oxford, um, and on the, uh, the, the night he turned 21 and was therefore free of his promise, which he had kept, he wrote to his, uh, his girlfriend, Edith, renewing his love and wanting to marry her, and she wrote back to say that she was engaged to another man. But Tolkien, nothing daunted, set off by train to Birmingham, arrived, convinced her to break off the engagement and marry him instead. Um, and, they, and they did. She, she became a Catholic, um, and they married. Um, and uh, he finished his degree at Oxford right as the Great War was happening. So he, he, he finishes his degree, and he goes into this, the carnage of the Great War, like, like Lewis, um, and as Tolkien reflected later, he said, by 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. Um, so he really felt that devastation, but didn't lose his faith. He persisted in his faith during the war, but then had a 10 year slump after it, where he said, I almost ceased to practice my religion. Almost, he didn't completely, but almost ceased. Um, he ended up coming, he, he taught at Leeds, he came back to Oxford where he made the acquaintance of a certain atheist um, who later became a Christian, C.S. Lewis. They became great friends. Um, Lewis was hugely influential in his life as well. And there he settled in as a professor um, of Anglo-Saxon and of, of English literature for the rest of his career at Oxford, became a world-class philologist specialist in you know, the history um, of languages, of, of development of English, and, oh, by the way, in his spare time, um, apart from raising four children, he wrote The Hobbit, um, and then he wrote a sequel to The Hobbit, um, which took 10 years to write and almost didn't get published, um, and, oh, this book was called something you may have heard of, The Lord of the Rings, um, and this book he called a fundamentally religious and Catholic work which is really interesting because there's no overt religion in it. It's all underneath, it's all in the, in the foundations of it. And it's for that, obviously, that he's, he's most well known. Um, and he didn't do any overt sort of apologetics. Um, we could talk more about some of these things he did do, but his great essay on fairy stories actually contains in its epilogue quite a strong proclamation of the gospel. Um, so he, he was actually more evangelically minded, more minded towards evangelization than I think a lot of people realize. A very, very interesting figure. And he died um, 50 years ago this year. Wow, that's wonderful. Interesting. I want to come back to unfairy stories in a minute, but I, I just want to stick with you for just one second to tease out his childhood at the Birmingham Oratory, because I know that there will be some, some big fans like me of St. John Henry Newman here. So this is something that I never really realized until engaging with you on this question, Holly, that, I mean, he was really raised a generation removed from St. John Henry Newman. Yes. Um, and it, and so what, I mean, did, was he influenced by Newman? Did he know his work or was he, it, do you, would you consider his thought to be like Newman at all? I, I you know, I do. And in my research for, for this, this new biography, I really, I found that that connection is much stronger than I realized. Um, so we, we, we don't, in the materials we have extant, we don't have direct evidence that he knew specific works of, of, of Newman's, mm -hmm. um, but he did. He obviously knew Newman's work. Yeah. Um, so his guardian, Father Francis Morgan, had actually been Newman's personal secretary. Um, so this is a firsthand connection. Uh, and, and other members of the oratory where he grew up had known Newman well, had been you know, um, taught by Newman, had been brought into the, you know, the, the, the oratory um, by them. So he lived in an atmosphere that was just utterly shaped by Newman's thought um, and that, and it's shaped by the English oratorians of, of the Birmingham Oratory, not just Father Francis, but all of those oratorians, many of whom became his lifelong friends, not just um, Father Francis, whom he considered to be a second father. So I think we really can see a kind of spiritual lineage. Uh, so in terms of spiritual influence, I mean, 
Father Francis Morgan, he called him his second father, and he had been, you know, brought into the the, the Oratorian order by um, by Newman. So I think we can really look at Newman as a kind of spiritual grandfather to Tolkien, and we really do see, especially in Tolkien's attitude towards ecumenism, um, very, very close similarity to Newman's thought. I think it's absolutely the case that he knew Newman's thought on, on these matters. That's fascinating. I want to come back to um, ecumenism in a second, but let's let's launch right into this evangelization question, because that's sort of the topic that we've been given. And Michael, let me come back to you and just say, pose it this way. So Lewis was somebody who was evangelized by his friends and particularly by Tolkien. Um, in what way did he sort of grow out of that experience he had of being evangelized and think of himself as an evangelist in his literary work and maybe even his teaching career? Very good question. Um, yeah, Lewis was, well, he described himself as having passed over from atheism to Christianity. Um, though, of course, as I said in the, in the little sketch I gave, he had been baptized and raised in the faith over his first 10 or 12 years. Uh, so it's more like a, a resumption of a faith that he had, that he had turned his back on. Uh, his brother said that it was more like a, the recovery of a, after a long convalescence. Um, but he was, but it wasn't just, uh, you know, <laughs> returning to um, uh, a cold meal, <laughs> warming it up again. It, it was much more uh, um, a putting down of his roots much more deeply into really fertile, well-watered ground. And he suddenly flourished in his faith. Um, and one man who knew him well, uh, Walter Hooper, the late Walter Hooper, who, who was Lewis's editor and biographer, once described Lewis as, as the most converted man he ever knew. Um, there was almost nothing that, that his, his new found faith did not touch. Um, Bishop Barron was earlier talking about the responsibility of the laity to follow the, the evangelical counsels of, of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And um, I think a good case can be made for the fact that Lewis did follow those those counsels pretty pretty faithfully, uh, especially poverty. Uh, he he was he was very very generous with his money. He, he once said that unless our charities are actually causing us to go without, then we're probably not giving enough. And he once got in trouble with a tax man because he <laughs> he managed to he, he got so many royalties and then gave them away so instantly, and then was landed with a huge tax bill that he couldn't pay. Um, <laughs> but to your, to your point about evangelism, yes, he he had been evangelized. He had he could remember what it was like to be outside a living faith. He could remember the perplexities, the oddities, the weirdness of of the faith, and I think that's one of the reasons what that he became such an effective apologist evangelist uh, that he didn't forget it um, and so he was able to to help people over the styles and the hurdles into well first of all into into just a sort of uh, preparedness to to accept faith what lewis calls the the preparatio evangelica the, the just laying the groundwork for faith um you mentioned kindly in your introduction that I, I've written this guide to Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man. And The Abolition of Man is not an obviously evangelistic work. It's a philosophical work. It's all about objective value. Um, but Lewis saw that b before you can begin to, as it were, present a, a, a Christian case for how, how Jesus will uh, allow, our, you know, our, our Christian faith will allow us to be to be good and true and beautiful in our own way, uh, you have to establish that goodness, truth, and beauty are, are real qualities and not just our subjective projections upon the world. Um, and that's what he at attempts to do in The Abolition of Man, um, which I think in, in some ways can be regarded as, as the theme of his, of his output as a writer. Uh, and all the other works that he ever put out were sort of variations upon that theme. Goodness, truth, and beauty are objective realities, and we, we need to accord our life so that they respond to these objective realities. Um, in, interestingly, in his, his path back to faith, he said that it, in some ways he was evangelized by non-Christians. 
in the, that is to say, non-Christians who accepted the objectivity of value, who were who were good, chaste, honest. They were following the light uh, as far as it had been granted to them. And Lewis, in his in his very atheistic phase, had had su- supposed that these weren't these were voluntary subjects. Uh, they weren't to be required of all candidates. Uh, you know, sobriety, chastity, honesty. Well, if you if you want it, go for it. But th- but then these 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 young men at Oxford, who, by the way, none of them Christians, he said, uh, by their very attempt to be virtuous, evangelized Lewis, which I think is a very interesting way of realizing that God's grace works in in very mysterious ways, um, not just through you know the professionally religious or or the deliberately evangelistic, but through any number of means. Yeah. That's that's really helpful. Uh, I n- I'd never heard that before about the you know being evangelized by these Ooh, Christians. Ooh. Very wonderful, um, Holly. Just to building on what Father Michael just said. Just you know, so in my mind, I think of Lewis. You know, Lewis has so many tools. And, and first of all, one of the things that we've already named this, but we want to highlight it a little bit more, is that both Lewis and Tolkien were laymen. They were lay lay people, right? Which is one of the themes, of course, that Bishop Barron was was talking about. And I think a very important aspect to both of their both of their lives and their work of evangelization. But when I think of Lewis's literary output, you know, it's like he's got all these different tools, like literary tools for evangelization, right? I mean, there are some days when mere Christianity just knocks it out of the park for me. Sorry, that's an American baseball. And <laughs> Bishop Barron did the same thing. I don't know. Hit when, it for six. Right, whatever. Hit the for six. Exactly. Yes. Right? When, when, when Lewis lays out just with this sort of logical beauty, the, the, the trilemma, right? You know, that ends with, you know, or you can worship him as the Lord or whatever, you know? I mean, it just like brings tears to my eyes, right? But then there are times when, you know, more satisfying is reading the silver chair and, and, and reading the part where Jill faces Aslan at the stream and he says, there is no other stream. You know, I mean, just bowls me over. Now, Tolkien didn't have the same kind of, like, he wasn't on the radio, for example, during World War II, essentially delivering the talks that would become the most famous book of Christian apologetics in the English language, right? Um, but he had, he, had, he had a different thing going in many respects in his life. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is, personally, they 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 both have sort of different things to draw from in their in their evangelistic endeavors. One of them that occurs to me is even though Michael you mentioned that Lewis married late in his life and he did end up becoming responsible for a couple of children, right? Tolkien was a family man through and through. He had a whole house full of kids, right? And he is, you know, you know, hiding away at night trying to write his to write his thing. So I guess what I'm getting at is it just maybe a very open-ended question back to you about sort of how is this combination of factors in his life sort of adding up to create an evangelist? That's a, a great question. And it, it kind of comes back to, to um, again, Bishop Barron's call earlier to the layman to go out and and be living the faith and and living these these councils because Tolkien did that. I mean, he really he really did that. And we should remember that you know the Lord of the Rings was published um, when quite late in his life, um, 1954. Uh, you know, so he had already had a long, um, you know, a long career as an academic. Um, he had retired, uh, so he had a little bit of fame as from the Hobbit, but of a relatively minor kind. The, the great fame of the Hobbit kind of came after the Lord of the Rings. But came back. Oh, there's the other book that he wrote. So for most of most of his life, he was witnessing through his life, through his ordinary life, through fidelity to his wife. Um, and so that's, again, living out that counsel of, of chastity, you know, as a, as a married man being faithful to his wife um, through sickness and in health, how, of which there was quite a lot of sickness. Um, for instance, Tolkien, his health was really permanently damaged by his getting trench fever in the Great War. Um, he had it, a very bad case of it, and it, it you know, damaged his health permanently. Um, and so, and they were usually short of money. I mean, with four children, this is before the NHS, um, he's trying to educate them in Catholic schools, he's trying to provide for them. And he had a job as a professor, but he was also grading examination papers during the vacations for extra money. Um, so this is a man who is just really doing what it takes to, to raise up his family and provide for them. But he's, and he's, he's living out this life as a witness to his family. 
And he's also being very active as a layman um, in Oxford. So he's visible as a role model to his students. He was involved in a number of Catholic associations, the Newman Association, the Newman Society, the Catenians. Um, he was really active in these organizations dedicated to strengthening the faith of Oxford students in particular, and of just Oxford you know, ordinary people, the Catenians, um, at a time when he had a lot of things on his plate. He could easily have said, I'll, I'll just leave that to the, to, to the priests, you know, let them, let them handle the, that, I've got my own work to do. But he, but he didn't. He gave of his time um, and his energy when, when those were really in short supply. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the Catholic impact, the, the Christian impact of Lord of the Rings, because when he is presenting his story, which is a story about you know good and evil and beauty and um, and virtue and suffering, these are not things that are abstract to him. They are realities that he has lived through his whole life. Um, he he knows them from the inside, and so when he presents them in this great story. They're real. So he's able to present pictures of virtue and of, of beauty. And they're believable because he's, he's really been living, he's been living those evangelical councils. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, let's let's um, transition to this, this big question of the fact that Tolkien was a Catholic and Lewis was an Anglican and how that the relationship to each other um, as in a sense like separated brethren um, what that means to each of their um, evangelical, I don't know, their, their evangel evangelistic work, I suppose. Uh, Michael, let me throw it back over to you and ask you the very simple question that I heard you answer for someone else a day or two ago, I believe. I think that the, the audience would be interested to hear your answer. Why did Lewis never become a Catholic? Because he didn't receive the call to become a Catholic, <laughs> or at least he didn't hear it. Um, for how about and I think that's, that, that is the honest answer. Um, Jim Comer, who's a, a Lewis scholar in New York City, he's written on this topic uh, and points out very prudently, uh, very wisely, that Lewis was a sufficiently mature Christian to know that if he had received the call to enter the Catholic Church and resisted it, he would have known that he was in deep spiritual peril, because uh, he would have been disobeying his conscience. Um, so we just have to accept the fact that for some reason, he did not either receive it or did not hear it. Um, Peter Kraft, another Lewis scholar in America, said that, you know, <laughs> um, Lewis would have lost large tranches of his audience um, if he had become a Catholic. And that, you know, in, in the providence of the mysterious providence of God, that, that may have been, as it were, the, the, the better path. That Lewis, you know, he was a, he was a baptized believer. He, he was, in that sense, uh, within the household of faith, um, obviously a, a separated brother, as, as, as Catholics would, would, would have to say, but nonetheless, he had received that sacrament of initiation into the Catholic faith. Um, and if he had Gone all uh, gone whole hog in, um, it, he would immediately have lost millions of readers, uh, both during his lifetime and in the decades since. Um, it's it's a mysterious topic. Lewis himself, of course, you know, he he would have said he would have advanced various reasons why he he did not regard the Catholic Church as as, as something he needed to um, enter. But not, and and indeed, he described himself rather disingenuously actually as, as as a very ordinarily a very ordinary layman of the Church of England neither especially high nor especially low nor especially anything else um, which is nonsense because <laughs> he was a very high Anglican um, he, he he went to confession he fasted on Fridays he believed in purgatory he prayed for the dead he talked about the blessed sacrament he believed in a male only priesthood had a very high view of priesthood he doubted the, the virtues of the, the morality of contraception um, he had a high view of natural theology all these very you know Catholic or Catholic friendly beliefs and practices and dispositions um, and the fact that he was such close friends with with Tolkien and and various other Catholics uh, indicates how very Catholic and Anglican he was. Um, there were one or two things he just couldn't get over, 
um, to do with the Pope and to do with the Blessed Virgin. But in all these other respects, he you know he was much more Catholic than many Catholics. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if I could just follow up by by inviting you to give us your take on um, something that I'm sure any reader of uh, Mere Christianity will remember, which is Lewis's famous analogy at the beginning, where he talks about he's about being in a hallway or or something something of that nature, a hall, passageway, a hallway that then leads into rooms. Would you? What is your take on what? What does he mean by that? Yeah, so in Mere Christianity, this book that grew out of those radio broadcasts he gave during the Second World War, he, has a, he, he, he assembles those talks, those rather disparate talks, under this umbrella term of Mere Christianity and explains what that means in a, in a preface. And he says that Mere Christianity, as he's using the term, refers to the, the broad, central, mainstream of the faith, which, to, to which Anglicans and Catholics and Methodists and Presbyterians would, would all assent. And indeed, he sent out um, a draft of the book to be read by representatives of, of these uh, different traditions to see whether they thought it was acceptable. Uh, and they did. Um, so what he means by mere Christianity is, is that overlap between the various traditions, denominations, ecclesial communities, uh, however you want to term them, um, the Vincentian canon, as it's sometimes been called, um, what has been believed by, by all Christians in all places at all times. Um, that's what he means by the hallway. And that's what he's beckoning people into. He's not going to tell them whether they need to become Anglicans or Catholics or Presbyterians. Just accept this. Uh, and then once you've entered the hallway, then you can choose which room of the house you're going to go and spend your time in because it's in the rooms where there, where there are chairs and fires and meals. Uh, but the hallway is just an entrance passage where you, you take off your coat and, and put down your umbrella. Um, and if he can beckon anybody into that hall, he said he will have achieved what he was setting out to accomplish. Uh, and the rest he will leave to you to sort out under your own steam. And he says, that the, but the main thing he, he says is, in your choice of the room to go into, you must, you must be motivated by questions of truth and holiness. Does true holiness reside in this room? Or am I merely attracted by the, by the panelling on the door or by the particular doorkeeper? Um, no, 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 that, that's not a, an adequate reason for going into the room. Um, you must ask much more uh, searching spiritual questions to do with, 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 with holiness and piety and charity. Uh, in order to select your, your particular room. Now, from a, a Catholic point of view, the, this, ecclesiolo this ecclesiological model doesn't work very well, uh, unless you sort of reinterpret the hallway, as I think it, it can fairly legitimately be interpreted, um, in the sense I just mentioned, to do with, with the sacrament of baptism. Um, that all Christians who have received baptism in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have received a, a, a valid sacrament. Uh, the Catholic Church teaches that. Um, so you could understand, from a Catholic point of view, the whole way in that sense. Yeah. And then I think it, it makes a little bit better logic. Yeah. What, what would Tolkien make of this? You know, I mean, what, what, it, what were his feelings of the fact that Lewis didn't become Catholic? And, and maybe what were his sort of ecumenical, what was his ecumenical theology? Well, interestingly, Tolkien was was very, very ecumenically minded, um, and it's was very he was very clear throughout his life that Lewis, though an Anglican, was a fellow Christian, was a, was a brother in the faith, um, and you know, we don't have any details about what he what he thought about Lewis um, becoming staying an Anglican. Um, I mean, sort, sort of fairly obviously, he would have wished him to go on and to become a Catholic, but it didn't impair their friendship at all. Um, and he, he was a member of the Inklings, that group of, uh, of Christians who met and you know, socially and met to share their, their works, um, read, read from their works in progress, of which there were a number of Catholics, but mostly Anglicans and I think one Presbyterian. Um, and he participated in discussions about matters of, of theology um, as well, you know, going at it, discussing these things with his, um, with his separated brethren. Um, in a in a way that was was friendly. Um, I mean, he said he said the conversation suddenly got quite lively, so that you might think as you looked at the conversation that they were you know foes, you know, about to come to blows with each other. But this was just the dynamic, the dynamic enthusiasm of the conversation because they were they would 
you know, emerge as, as complete friends at the end of it. Um, and he, he said at one point um, that even to love our Lord and to call him Lord is a grace and may lead to more graces. And I think that's a fundamental sort of summary of how he viewed this, that that, that sacrament of baptism brings all of them in um, to, to the church and that there's that, that grace in acknowledging, you know, our Lord as Lord, that, that is a grace as it will bring, bring more graces. And he was always, I think, keenly aware of, of the goodness of the faith of his of his non-Catholic brethren. Um, I mean, f- for instance, when Charles Williams, one of the Inklings, died in 1945, um, he had a mass said for him at Blackfriars in Oxford and served at it, um, which in 1945 was a, a you know a very ecumenical gesture to make for an Anglican. Um, and he'd the same when Lewis died. He had a mass said for him um, and served at it and and went to Lewis's funeral. Um, you know, an Anglican, Anglican funeral. Um, and he, he quoted with approval something that the Anglican Williams said, that, uh, that, that the duty of every Christian is to tend the accredited altar, even though the Holy Spirit might choose to come down in some other place. So he explicitly acknowledges that there is an accredited altar, in his view. There is the one church. He's very clear that he believes that the, the Catholic Church is the one church established by Christ. Um, but he acknowledges that our Lord is not limited. He says that explicitly, that our Lord is not limited by the church that he has established and can grant graces to those who are outside of it. Um, and I think that sort of generosity of spirit is, is so typical of Tolkien. And he, what he's doing is he is in line with the church teaching that eventually became you know, fully, fully codified um, in the decree on ecumenism and the Second Vatican Council. But Tolkien had been living that for decades um, before it became a, a council document. That's interesting. Let me stay with you, Holly, and maybe um, just pivot slightly to what Tolkien, what, what, what Tolkien sort of hoped to accomplish for the sake of Christ in the church with his writing. You know, when he was writing The Lord of the Rings, in a way, my, you know, I always think of it as almost a kind of, um, he, he just couldn't help himself. There was this world that he just had to build. And these stories just sort of came out miraculously from them. But, you know, that's maybe overstating it a little bit. But I mean, did he have a sort of conscious understanding that, that what he was writing could affect the hearts of people for Christ and maybe even sort of win them for the church? That's such a great question, Andrew, because the answer is yes, but the kind of a qualified yes, because he's very, very clear that the Lord of the Rings is not an allegory. I repeat, not an allegory. Um, and he doesn't want it to be interpreted as such. Um, he, and I think he, he wanted to make sure people didn't make these superficial sort of equivalencies. Um, that said, I mean, he, he said of the Lord of the Rings, he said, the Lord of the Rings is a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously in the writing, but consciously in the revision. And he, and he goes on to say, and that is why I have cut out all references to religion in it. Huh. And if you're thinking to yourself, wait, what? No, I didn't get the quote wrong. Um, he said he, he wrote it um, just without without consciously thinking about it being Catholic or Christian, it came from his, from his deep faith. Um, and yet at one point, you know, someone asked him like, oh, well, who, who, is, who is Eru Iluvatar, the God in the Lord of the Rings? He says, well, the God, you know, the one, our God, like there's only one and it's, it's the God of Lord of the Rings is, is the one. But then consciously he's seeing it in the revision and the polishing, um, making it consciously religious and Catholic and he's doing it by making sure that there are not these overt references to religion. And I have puzzled over this a lot. And I think it has to do with his approach to evangelization, which, um, which is one of many. It's not that this is the only way to do it. It was his way, which is to go kind of under the radar, um, to be presenting these images at the level of image, these ideas at the level of image, of theme, um, where he's suggesting them 
Um, so for instance, he's quite clear in his letters that Lembas, the wave red of the elves, is the Eucharist. Um, insofar as we can make a, a direct connection, he's, he's pretty clear that this, this is a, a Eucharistic image. Um, and if you go and you reread it, you realize, oh, it, it really is. It's this, this food that is sustaining. And the, you know, the more that you rely on it, the more it sustains you. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful image. But it's all the more powerful because he doesn't put it in your face. Um, and you think about you know, the, the way that he unfolds the working of providence um, with, with Frodo, you know, he's, Frodo is saved, he's, he's, um, he's saved from, you know, becoming the new Sauron, and because he, because Frodo fails in the quest. This is an important thing to realize. He gets all the way to Mount Doom, and he has been broken by the ring, and he seizes the ring for his own, and declares that he will not fulfill the quest. Um, and Tolkien said in one of his letters that this was actually a working through of the theme of the petition in the Our Father, lead us not into temptation. Um, and so providentially, Gollum seizes, tries to seize the ring and fulfills the quest in that way. Why was Gollum there? Because at an earlier stage, Frodo and then also Sam and then also Bilbo further back in The Hobbit had chosen to spare Gollum's life even though he deserved death, they, they exercise mercy and pity. And so we see the workings of providence and providence is actually named explicitly in, in, in this. So this is the kind of way that he's, he's working this out. And I think because of that, um, the Lord of the Rings becomes extraordinarily effective in reaching people who perhaps would be not willing to read a book that was more explicitly Christian. Um, and. And he does, in another letter, he says that the Lord of the Rings is an exemplary legend in, in the sense that he, he intends it to be um, an example, a, a picture of the virtues. You should look at it and say, I want to be virtuous in this way and that way. But he's weaving it all in so subtly that it's not, it's not in your face. You take it in and you think, wow, this is, this is really beautiful. I, I like that. I want, I want that. Where can I find that? And he and he succeeded. I, I've got a friend in Oxford who recently told me that he, in in his pre-Christian days, read the Lord of the Rings and found it so beautiful um, that he said to himself, "Tolkien was a Christian, and anybody who can write a work that is that beautiful must be onto something." <laughs> uh, which led this friend of mine to become a Christian himself. That's very interesting. Let let me let me throw the same kind of question to you, Michael, because. Where, where Holly says um, Tolkien was, in a sense, like deliberately making his work religious by removing the religion, Lewis seems to be doing the exact opposite. I mean, the, 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 the you know, Aslan is just sort of obviously this Christ figure, and it sort of goes on from there. I mean, is he, is he deliberately employing just a, a very different strategy from Tolkien? Uh, how, mm. What is your take on that? Yeah, I think uh, Tolkien was was much more naturally mythic, mythological, mythopoeic than Lewis. Um, and an, an important consideration too is that the Lord of the Rings is set in a pre-Christian era. I mean, it's meant to be part of the history of our, our world, but uh, long before the incarnation. So in that sense, the lembas bread that sustains you is, is like, is not, is like a, an equivalent to the manna. Right. You know, the manor itself gestures towards the Eucharist, and likewise the lembas. Um, but neither of them it should be read allegorically as such. And C.S. Lewis, when he came to write the Narnia Chronicles, was not setting his stories in a pre-Christian period of this world. He was, he was inventing a whole other world called Narnia, um, which is sort of parallel to our world. And, and so he asked himself if, if Christ, having become human in our world, were to become incarnate in this magical world, what form would he take and how would it work? And, and the answer was he would take the form of a lion and, and you know the rest of the story, I hope. Um, but that, that's what he called a supposition. Let us suppose that the, the Christ became incarnate in, in a world where animals speak. Um, let, let's suppose it worked out in such and such a fashion. And that's that's supposition, not allegory, as far as Lewis is concerned. The allegory is when you, you give a concrete form to, a, to an abstract thing, like in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, you have 
giant despair, locking people up in Doubting Castle. Um, we know what those that character and that place stand for because it's named in their very title. <laughs> despair is not a, a concrete thing, but it's concretized in a giant, and doubt is not a concrete thing, but it's concretized in a castle. And if you don't understand that the thing stands for the abstract term, then you're not properly reading the allegory. Narnia is not like that. You, you can read the story in its own terms and not make any equivalency with Christianity if you don't wish to. And there are plenty of people who, who do read it like that, especially for children who have no Christian education, but even some adults. Uh, the illustrator of the books, Pauline Baines, uh, who was a young, I think, 21-year-old artist when she was sent the, the, the manuscript of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to prepare her, her illustrations. She read the story and was profoundly moved by it, found herself in tears at the death of Aslan. And it was only when she closed the manuscript and began formulating her ideas for her pictures that it suddenly thought, oh, <laughs> I've read a story like that somewhere else. <laughs> um, and so you don't have to f force any kind of allegorical reading upon it, um, these parallels are more or less strong depending on, well, first of all, your level of religious education, and, and second of all, in, in the kind of reading you bring to bear on the book. Um, what else do you want to know? <laughs> I did. Well, I'll jump in to something, yeah, remind me of something you said, I think in Planet Narnia, about Lewis and Tolkien, I think you, if I correctly, you wrote, we must allow the two men to write in different ways. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind that they, there, there isn't that he, one of them is better than the other and how they approach this, this approach to evangelization and literature because they've just got different ways of doing it. Yeah. yeah. Lewis was always, he began at any rate, much more interested in allegory from a literary point of view. Indeed, he, he wrote a, a very learned study of medieval allegory called The Allegory of Love. That's how he made his academic reputation. And the first book that he published after he became a Christian, an adult Christian, was, was a reworking of The Pilgrim's Progress entitled The Pilgrim's Regress. Um, so he had a strong academic interest in allegory as such. Um, but I think you can see as his writing career progresses that he he finds it actually more advantageous, uh, more judicious to adopt more more subtle correspondences between the story world and and the world of of of, of real life Christianity. So that Narnia is, as I say, more suppositional than allegorical. And and the last novel Lewis wrote was um, a retelling of a classical myth, uh, the myth of Cupid and Psyche. And, and the subtitle of that novel, Till We Have Faces, is a myth retold. Um, so he's, he's, as it were, I think being gradually dragged in a, in a Tolkienian direction uh, as his writing career unfolds. That's, that's interesting. I don't know if literary scholars might say, you know, maybe it's the difference between like an early medievalist and a late medievalist or something, you know. Cool. But Anyway, in the in the minutes that remain, I want to I want to just kind of move towards this like the vision of hope that that both uh, that both of the authors um, project, um, but also the the realism the you know there there it, it's not it's not optimism right it's 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 joy in Lewis's terms or hope we could maybe use both words, but I'm thinking Holly about how in in Tolkien. If you read the Silmarillion, he tells us the story of the end of the world twice, at least, right? At the end of the first age, at the end of the second age. And then in the Lord of the Rings, we get this end of an age story that is full of really disturbing stuff, right? They, like the return of this darkness. And then this character of Saruman, who I, I don't know if anyone, anyone here like me sort of identifies him as this sort of, you know, this, this this awful kind of modern character, you know, who wants to kind of brutalize nature and reduce everything into, you know, these sort of, um, I, I don't know, to sort of take everything out of the realm of the, uh, of the pure and, and beautiful and, and that sort of thing, right? And, 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 uh, and adulterate it or something like that. So, but ultimately the Lord of the Rings is, you know, just an incredibly inspiring story and, and a triumph of hope. But I, I don't know, just want to throw it to you in an open-ended way. Like, it, is that your reading of Tolkien? I mean, how, how does that play, do you think, uh, you know, for us as evangelists to kind of champion his work? Well, I think, again, this is a great question because Tolkien's work is deeply infused with hope and with joy. But, but 
in a very a very deeply realistic way. I mean, this is a man who knew suffering. He was an orphan. He had fought in the Great War. His friends had been killed. He had suffered physical illness all of his life. Um, he had been poor. <laughs> he knew suffering. Um, and so what we see in The Lord of the Rings and all of his writings is a hope that is is tempered with realism. It's it's not wish fulfillment at all. It's it's a hope that's grounded in in faith, um, and it's a hope that does not pretend that there isn't a whole lot of suffering to endure along the way. And if you think about it, you know the Lord of the Rings. Okay, Sauron is defeated. Middle Earth is saved. We're all rejoicing. This is beautiful. Um, but we have to remember, you know, Frodo has been wounded. And I think one of the, the saddest and most beautiful lines of the, of the whole book, it comes near the end when Frodo is back in the Shire um, and he's, he's not doing well. And, and he says to Sam, he says, well, the, the Shire has been saved, but not for me. He has been wounded so deeply that he cannot be healed in this life. And I think that is a pretty profound insight into our sufferings in this life. He knew there are some wounds that will not be healed while we live, that will only be healed, um, you know, after, after our death. Um, and I think that is part of what gives his vision of hope um, such, such power. And I briefly alluded to the essay on fairy stories. Um, and in that great essay, uh, in the epilogue, he, he makes really a proclamation of the gospel. And he says that the reason that we rejoice in um, the happy ending of a fairy story or the happy ending of, say, The Lord of the Rings is, in fact, because these are echoes in the real world. Um, they're, they're echoes of a real world happy ending, which is the resurrection. Um, and he coins the word eucatastrophe, the good catastrophe. And he says that the, the, the resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the incarnation, um, which is itself the eucatastrophe of the whole of, of human history. Um, so it's the, it's the, the eucatastrophe is the sudden happy ending when everything seems to be lost. And um, you, you can't have that turn for joy unless you truly think that everything has been lost, which is precisely what we see on Calvary, right? It looks like hope is utterly lost. He's dead on the cross, but we have the resurrection. And that is the, that is the cosmic happy ending that he says really happened. And this is where legend and history meet and fuse because that real happy ending um, is what gives the power to all these fictional happy endings. But he says that the eucatastrophe does not deny the existence of discatastrophe, of sorrow and suffering. And he's very clear on that. And I think that is a huge message for us as evangelists that we live in a world that is broken. We are broken. Our world is broken. We are all have suffered, will suffer, are suffering. The people that we meet who need to hear the gospel are also broken and suffering. And acknowledging that pain does not take away from the message of hope. In fact, it gives credibility to it. And I think that's part of what makes Tolkien's message so powerful. Yeah. Michael, um, I would say that in a couple of key works, Lewis is very pessimistic um, and yet hopeful. And the works that I'm thinking of would be that hideous strength in in fiction and um, the abolition of man in nonfiction. It, what, what, what do you think those works, maybe or others, have to, have to say, sort of in the same vein as, as where we were going there in, in Holly's answer? Yeah, I think the abolition of man is, is possibly Lewis's most pessimistic work. I mean, the very title, the abolition of <laughs> man. Uh, <laughs> He's not painting a bright future, um, but that's a philosophical work. Uh, and therefore Lewis is just, as it were, outlining, forecasting the end result of a particular chain of, of philosophical thought, namely subjectivism, the idea of, of value not being objective. If that's the position you adopt, you'll eventually abolish yourself. Uh, you will make yourself inhuman or subhuman. So that is very pessimistic. That hideous strength is is a is a kind of novelistic version of the abolition of man, but in a in a much more of a Christian key. So that that work does end uh, with with some notes of hope, but but hope, the Christian the theological virtue of hope, is not the same thing as optimism. 
And interestingly, Lewis wrote a review of The Lord of the Rings when it was published in the 1950s. And, and he said, here in The Lord of the Rings, uh, we are released from facile optimism and wailing pessimism alike. Uh, he quotes his favorite line from the novel, um, there was there was gathering dark there, then and, and bravery and deeds that were not wholly vain, not wholly in vain. It is the cool middle point between illusion and disillusionment, he says. And that's one of the things that he most admired in The Lord of the Rings, which, by the way, without Lewis's endless encouragement, driven to the point of nagging at times, uh, Tolkien admits he would never have completed. Um, so Tolkien was hugely influential on Lewis becoming a Christian. Uh, Lewis was hugely influential on Tolkien writing his and completing his masterpiece. Um, so they, that was quite a good trade-off, I think. <laughs> um, as for uh, Lewis's own presentations of theological hope, yeah, I'm glad, Holly, that you mentioned Calvary, because, I mean, the, the, the one scriptural verse that C.S. Lewis refers to or alludes to more than any other, I think, is the cry of dereliction, the cry from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, from Psalm 22. And Lewis was fascinated by this cry, even before he was a, a theist, let alone a Christian. And it crops up in all his writings in one form or another. Um, and it speaks to this very point of, of you catastrophe, the good catastrophe depends upon a catastrophe. Uh, the goodness only emerges from the, the utter ruination of all your natural hopes. And unless you have got to that point of despair, of, of achieving natural hopes, uh, supernatural hope can't really land, that the seed won't sprout, as it were. Um, so in the Narnia Chronicles, for instance, Lewis has his own version of the, uh, the apocalypse in, in the last battle, which is the Narnian version of the book of Revelation. Uh, yeah, where everything goes from bad to worse. Uh, and there is a, a sort of Narnian equivalent of, of the cry of dereliction, when the Narnian king, despairing of saving his kingdom from the, the, the invading hordes, um, cries out in the darkness. He's bound to a tree, significant location, and he cries out in the darkness, praying to the Christ-like Aslan, come and save us now, and that's and the coldness and the darkness go on just as before, we're told. And then reaching down into the very roots of his, of his faith, as it were, this fictional king says, let me be killed. I ask nothing for myself, but come and save all Narnia. And it's at that moment of complete self-abnegation and self-gift that indeed his prayer is answered and, and all sorts of aid providentially is coming to his rescue, though he, though he doesn't yet know it. Um, and as a result of, of this faithful obedience in the darkest hour, he, he does find his way through to the, to the heavenly realms at the end of the story. And, and you know, having gone through the, the gate of death, the, the very first words which meet him on the other side are, well done, uh, uh, good, good and faithful servant who held firm in the darkest hour. So I think Lewis, like Tolkien, having gone through so much suffering, orf both of them orphans as a boy, both of them went through the First World War, um, they had wrestled with these deepest, darkest questions. But rather like uh, Brendan said this morning when he was talking about the, the bombing of Coventry, um, the bombing of Coventry c could, could have made his great-grandfather bitter, but instead it prompted him to build an altar or to rebuild an altar. Um, and I think in, in their own literary ways, Lewis and Tolkien were doing the same. Well, thank you. We are out of time, but um, I hope that we all uh, realize that despite the fact that Lewis and Tolkien have been dead a long time, they remain really just about the two best resources we have uh, from the literary canon in, in recent times for our work of evangelization. So thank you so much, Holly. Thank you so much, Father Michael. Thank you. <laughs>